Over the years, Charlie Luciano has been portrayed numerous times on TV and film. But what was the infamous crime boss actually like in real life? Let's take a look at some of his psychiatric evaluations that were carried out on Charlie Lucky during his time in prison. Welcome to OC Shorts, bringing you detailed historical snapshots of the American Mafia and other organised crime. Feel free to subscribe if you like that sort of thing. Today we're going to take a look at some of the evaluations that were carried out on Charlie Luciano during his time in prison from 1936 to 1946. Hopefully these will give us some indication of what the man, who is often referred to as the father of organised crime, was actually like. Hollywood and his audience has a fascination with the mob and over the past 50 years Charlie Luciano has been portrayed in different TV shows and films including Boardwalk Empire Mobsters Billy Bathgate Bugsy The Cotton Club The Valachi Papers The Gangster Chronicles and the 1973 Italian and English language film Lucky Luciano, as well as being one of the main focuses of the documentary series The Making of the Mob New York. Drop a comment below and let me know which portrayal of Luciano is your favourite. It may be one that I haven't listed. So how do these famous performances stand up against information on his character from his actual psychiatric evaluation and probation report? On June 18th, 1936, the day in which Luciano was sentenced to 30 to 50 years for compulsory prostitution, a pre-sentencing report was sent to the Court of General Sessions by Chief Probation Officer Irving W. Halpin. Using Luciano's birth name, Halpin states in his report that Lucania is a shallow, parasitic individual who is considerably wrapped up in his own feelings. The report continues. Lucania's social outlook is essentially childish, in that it is dominated by recklessness and a craving for action. His only asset as a leader consists of his apparent calmness at times of stress. This characteristic, which appears to have been based on his feeling that he could escape involvement, has passed for reserve and strength. As a consequence, he is accorded a degree of underworld respect. He manifests a peasant-like faith in chance and has developed an attitude of nonchalance. His behaviour patterns are essentially instinctive and primitive. His manner easy, copious and ingratiating. His freedom from conscience springs from his admitted philosophy. I never was a crumb and if I have to be a crumb I'd rather be dead. His ideals of life resolve themselves into money to spend, beautiful women to enjoy, silk underclothes and places to go in style. During the childhood phase of his life, the defendant was reared in an impoverished environment on the Lower East Side, and at an early age he was beyond the control of his parents. His behaviour patterns and social attitude during this formative period were largely conditioned by the influence of unwholesome associates, with the result that by the time he was 18 years old, he acquired a definitely criminalistic pattern of conduct. Considering that this report was handed to the Court of General Sessions prior to Luciano's sentencing. In my opinion, the wording is heavily loaded against Charlie Lucky, especially with such language as describing him as a parasitic individual. Regardless, in this potentially biased analysis, we are still able to pick out certain phrases that give us an indication of what made Luciano highly successful in his chosen criminal career. The report mentions Luciano's calmness at times of stress, something which is in contrast to the hot-headed portrayal we see in the first few seasons of Boardwalk Empire, albeit that Vincent Piazza is actually portraying a younger version of Luciano. Halpin mentions that Lucky had reserve and strength. Having reserve, according to one definition, would mean that Luciano would be able to hold back from expressing his own opinions unless he felt it was absolutely necessary. It would also mean that he was comfortable with his own counsel. This reserve, coupled with the strength that Halpin mentions, suggests that Luciano was confident with his own ideas and actions. A trait that would have installed belief in Luciano from those around him. 
The report then references that Charlie manifests a peasant-like faith in chance and has developed an attitude of nonchalance. This faith in chance would not have been too dissimilar to many of Luciano's more contemporaries who came from impoverished backgrounds and felt that they had nothing to lose when pursuing the riches of a criminal career. An attitude which led to his famous quote, I never was a crumb and if I have to be a crumb, I'd rather be dead. One interesting phrase in the analysis is that Halpin states that Luciano's manner is easy, copious and ingratiating all of which could be considered excellent traits of a well-liked leader, unlike those of a dictator. Famous mob turncoat Joseph Giocargo Valacci recalls a story when he was attending Luciano's mother's funeral in 1935. Charlie Lucky noticed that Valacci was looking glum and inquired as to why Giocargo appeared so sad. Valacci explained that of course he was sad for Luciano's loss but he was also having problems with his own numbers operation. Luciano, who was probably at the time the most powerful mobster in New York and was operating several levels above Valachi, reached out to help the lowly soldier with his problem, despite dealing with his own grief at his mother's funeral. This left a positive impression on Valachi. On June the 30th, 1936, Dr. Leon E. Kainholz examined Luciano and produced a psychiatric report. Kainholz initially produced a social history of Luciano, which included his parents' occupations, his education level, his work history, his drug addiction, and the fact that he had been in a relationship with a woman for six years, but, in his own words, couldn't get along with the girl. Dr. Kainholz also noted that despite Luciano claiming an income of $25,000 a year, the authorities believed that he actually made closer to $1 million a month. Dr. Leon Kainholz then completed his diagnostic summary. He exhibits no psychosis at this time. He is of average intelligence. His progress in school was poor. He showed delinquent tendencies at this time and was sent to truant school because of it. He uses drugs and admits gonorrhea on seven occasions. He complains of kidney and sinus trouble at present. He admits he did not like to work so never held a job for any length of time but made his money at gambling so he claims. He has no trade. He claims to be a barber but admits he cannot cut hair but gave that so he might do that type of work in prison. He is the product of poor environment and heredity and received little supervision as a child. He has been a chronic offender since childhood. He admits trafficking in drugs, women, gambling or wherever he can make some easy money. He is reputed to have been with Al Capone at one time. Other than gambling and sexual promiscuousness his habits have been temperate. He has lived a nomadic type of existence, following the races, resorts and gatherings where he might make his money quickly. He admits to his previous arrests and not all are listed. He claims his innocence in this case. Most of what was written provides nothing new and doesn't give us too much additional information as to Luciano's character. Apart from further backing up the fact that Luciano liked to follow the action and didn't want to work for a living preferring quick money. Luciano was then transferred from Sing Sing to Clinton Prison at Danamora in upstate New York. Here, at some point, another psychiatric evaluation is carried out on Luciano. It is very similar to the analysis at Sing Sing, but with a couple of differences. Under personal history, it states, he is single, had first heterosexual experience at age 14, and admits gonorrhea. Inmate states he uses alcoholic beverages very moderately. He denies the use of narcotic drugs. The denial of drug abuse contradicts the examination carried out by James A. Kearney, a physician at Sing Sing Prison. It would appear that the probation report, despite its potentially biased nature, provides a clearer understanding of Luciano's character than that of the psychiatric evaluations. If we quickly look back at Chief Probation Officer Irving W. Halpert's report, we see that he uses the line, His only asset as a leader consists of his apparent calmness at times of stress. This phrase appears quite derogatory in its statement that he only had one leadership asset. In my opinion, he must have been doing something right. If we look at the state of the New York mob whilst Luciano was at the peak of his powers from 1931 to 1946, 
we can see that even considering he was in prison for 10 years, there was relative peace for the five families, both internally and with each other. It would appear that only after Luciano's deportation that things started to unravel with his stewardship missing. Let's take a look at a few of the key events that happened whilst the respected leader was no longer on American shores. In April 1951, Albert Anastasia had Vincent Mangano and his brother Philip murdered and took over the top spot in that family. In October 1951, Luciano family underboss Willie Moretti was murdered. On May 2nd 1957, Frank Costello survived a bullet from Vincent Giganti on the orders of Vito Genovese. On October the 25th that same year, Albert Anastasia was gunned down at a barber shop at the Park Sheraton Hotel. In an assassination planned by Genovese, Carlo Gambino and his close ally Joe Biondo. And following all of this, there was the disastrous Appalachian affair, the gallo Profacci conflict and the Bonanno civil war after Bonanno had allegedly plotted to whack Gambino and Lucchese. Albeit these last two were slightly after Luciano's death. Perhaps if Luciano had been able to remain in the United States, then these events wouldn't have occurred and the history of the mob would be very different. But who knows? I hope you found that interesting. Thanks for watching.